Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and, and focus on art history, as we're both art historians. Okay. And um, so I want to point out that, that two of the first feminist two of the first feminist art historians and the first two WCA presidents were you and Anne Sutherland Harris, and you were among the feminist scholars who transformed the discipline of art history. Could you talk about some of the important early work by, by you and um, um, Anne and um, other WCA art historians, and how is it received within the CAA? Yes, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, first, I want to make clear how important the CAA was at that time for this, uh, this uh, business that feminist art history. CAA in those years was the big tent, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the annual conference. Before there were regional or subdisciplinary conferences anywhere, it was just a once a year conference where people in our field met. This was before there was an internet, before there were emails. It was where we gathered. Uh, it, it served, the annual meeting served not only as a job placement center, meeting place for networking and so forth, but critically as a forum for cutting edge scholarship. Mm -hmm. That's where papers were given that became articles that became well known in the field. Um, feminist art history, American feminist art history, I should say, in the US was born in the crucible of WCA CAA interaction. That's where it all mm, so it generated. Um, the Women's Caucus and the Marxist Caucus brought revolutionary change to traditional art history. I would say we were sort of parallel at the time in the 70s. Both caucuses existed. We uh, fought to have sessions and, and all that, but we uh, did something really quite important. I think both groups, traditionally sessions, art historical sessions were framed by art historical categories, medieval art, Baroque art, 20th century art, so forth. Our sessions ask, ask social questions, questions that uh, of course led to the socialist um, uh, art history as well as the Marxist uh, branch of that. We asked social questions and demanded that art historians address them. Uh, the early 70s saw the enthusiastic integration of feminist topics in the regular CAA program. I, I, I mentioned that because I really didn't remember it that way. And I look back at the CAA programs to see how very many of them were in so-called regular programs at first. Uh, Linda Nockland's famous session, Eroticism and Female Imagery in 19th Century Art, which became the major, her, her contribution to that became the unforgettable article where she showed the male model and holding a banana and all that. That was 72 a session, she had a CAA session, uh, and her very justly famous 1971 article, Why There Have Been No Great Women Artists, opened the way for a creative explosion in feminist art history. Much of that was simultaneous with Nachlin. Uh, it takes nothing away from the importance of that essay to point out that that wasn't the only thing going on at the time. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of feminist art history happening just about the same years. Um, Linda explained in that classic article why women artists weren't called great. Carol Duncan ch challenged the notion of greatness itself mm -hmm. in a classic article, to me classic, called When Greatness is Just a Box of Wheaties. <laughs> Uh, you're calling out the patriarchal propaganda uh, that attaches to our notion of greatness. Uh, in another conference paper, Carol uh, exposed the patriarchal propaganda in 18th century French painting in an article called Happy Mothers and Other New Ideas in French Art. That was 72, CAA 72. Alessandra Comini took on the myth of solitary male genius, juxtaposing the self-centered art of Edvard Munch with the universalism of Katie Kalvitz. Mm -hmm. um, and Norma Browdy, in a 1975 CAA paper called Degas Misogyny, uh, she called out not Degas himself, she's been misunderstood in that, but his male contemporaries, the mm -hmm. real misogynists who pen that label on Degas. Mm -hmm. uh, many of these papers were gathered in Norma's and my first volume of, of collected essays, Questioning the Litany of Feminism and Art History, 1982. They were pa basically papers from the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, we also included uh, another important breakthrough article by Pat Minardi on quilts as a feminist art form. Right. And this was, of course, the beginning of scholarship on women artists, so the traditional women artists. We included from a Fox Hofrichter's first article on Judith Leister, and my own first Artemisia Gentileschi article mm -hmm. called Artemisia and Susanna, which began as a CAA paper would later lead to the first of my, my books on Artemisia and absorption with her work for a lot of my life. 
uh, Braddy's essay on Miriam Shapiro appeared in that first volume. But to return to Anne Harrison and the first uh, art historian president, Anne made her monumental major contribution in co-curating with Lyndon Auckland the groundbreaking exhibition, Women Artists 1550 to 1950. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an incredible feat of scholarship. I think not really uh, well understood by younger scholars today who benefit from the groundbreaking research that was done to create that show. Uh, the, scho the scholarly tools that those two classically trained art historians used to uncover and discover countless women artists and position them in art history was, I think, a, a, a something so important. We, we put it right up there on the pedestal. Uh, when the show opened in Los Angeles in 1976, the CAA held a reception and welcomed it. It was uh, still seen as part of us, so, you know, our sort of thing. But in the later 70s, as feminism expanded in the country and the world, there was resistance, there began to be resistance to feminist topics in the regular CAA program. And you see this if you look at the programs. In part, mm -hmm. uh, the WCA drained off the energy as our independent conference program began to grow. But among traditional art historians who chaired the conference programs and selected topics, chose topics, uh, there was clearly a backlash, a desire to, again, construct a kind of wall between regular art history and feminist art history. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll tell a personal story because it's a very good case in point. Um, Diane Russell, the uh, curator of uh, graphic arts at the National Gallery and I proposed a session for the 1978 CAA meeting, which we called Questioning the Litany, uh, which we were going to, which would of course include them as papers. Uh, the CAA board turned down our session at first because as one board member explained, it did not represent what is presently, presently significant for the discipline. <laughs> this was well into feminist uh, active scholarship at that point, uh, it, but it kind of encapsulates the, the, this kind of uh, backlash feeling. But the resistance went, was out there beyond CAA. When Norma and I collected some of these essays that we, we took the title, Happy Diane and I were happy to uh, have that happen, and uh, used it for a collection of essays we wanted to publish, we tried some 15 publishers before mm -hmm. HarperCollins uh, took it, had wonderful editor Cass Canfield Jr., who, who saw the importance of what we did and, and championed it. But I tell that story to a lot of people who try to get published because you, you've got to keep at it, you've got to keep mm -hmm. on. 15 is not enough. 16 might be the one, so uh, <laughs> uh, keep trying. Uh, well, that book, of course, went on to become a college course staple, and it's, it, I'll say it is still in print after 40 years. 